Okay, let's get started. At your table, you have a quite a pack of papers. If you want to take that first thing that's stapled together, it says Study Guide Week 4, and turn over that front page. On that front page, oops, you are going to see question number two at the bottom of day four, and it says, on the outline of the mountain below, but there's no <laughs> outline of a mountain below. <laughs> I forgot to draw it on. So here's my lovely picture, <laughs> and you can probably make a more beautiful. So this is my idea of a cloud at the top. <laughs> So you can make your own probably more beautiful mountain with an arrow pointing towards the top, an arrow pointing towards the middle, and an arrow pointing towards the bottom. And these are the things that I'm going to want you to fill in with the options that I give you, okay? <laughs> so there you go. Does that make everyone know what they need to do? All right. There's that. Second thing is... Um, Sarah walked in, one of the first things she asked me was, why is Pastor Eric's name up here? <laughs> okay, so Pastor Eric was, at, was the man who was at church on Sunday, right, who is involved in our Africa Church Planting Initiative through the FEC. And he um, is like the uh, counterpart in the U.S., and they're really working to get pastors or men who have graduated from seminaries over there, African men who have graduated from African seminaries out to rural areas with the gospel and the real gospel before the false gospel that is spreading so quickly through Africa reaches there. So um, he was there. And I, we just have a card here to Pastor Eric and your family. So when we close, we're going to pray for him. But if some of you during a break or afterwards could just write a little note, thanks for coming. Um, nice to meet your family, praying for church planting in Africa, something, you know, a little note to him, and then we're going to send that off to him. That's why his name's up there. All right. All right. Now, last week, I warned you that this week we were going to practice memory verses with one another, and it could be that Exodus 6 or anything from chapter 15. So what I want you to do now, we kind of... Like this table you could do in twos, but most of the tables we're going to do in threes. Now, maybe, you know, this is what I'm going to memorize. And I don't know anything about it, but this is the verse I want to memorize. Maybe you got it all memorized. Maybe you're somewhere in between, okay? So maybe you're like, this is what I want to memorize and just read it, get it going through your mind. But that's what we're going to do for the next few moments, okay? Practice our memory verses. Okay, let's come back together. Now, sometimes we need a little fear of what's to come, so that's why we do this accountability <laughs> to, to help us memorize. All right, so next week we're going to do it again at our tables, okay? So just be forewarned. You have been warned. Okay, on that pack of papers, that next piece of paper you have, I believe, says Pharaoh's hard heart. As I said last week, we we're going to talk about that a little bit this week. Because I thought we were going to have all kinds of time, and then I forgot something else that I wanted to do this week. But, so I gave you some of the answers to the paper that we were going to go through. So you have the worksheet that we were going to go through. But I do want to just really quickly, come on in, Sue, really quickly go through a few things. Some things we have to remember in our minds before we come to the, the verses that um, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Those verses can kind of... Um, they don't sound real great. <laughs> okay. Um, two things. God is divinely sovereign over all things. As we read our Bible, that's what we find. God is sovereign over all. Another thing as we read the Bible is that um, individuals are responsible before the Lord for their sin. Both things. Right? God's divinely sovereign, but individuals are responsible for their sin. And sometimes as we put those together, they just don't mesh real good and it is really a bit of a mystery okay that we can't answer everything that as we would like all right but we are not the lord we don't see all things as he does okay and sometimes we just have to hold the mystery a little bit in our hands 
We do know also, as we read the Bible as a whole, that um, if the Lord calls and you start to turn in repentance towards him, he's not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I'm hardening your heart. Okay, that is not the Lord. Okay, so that is not what is happening to Pharaoh. Okay. Um, on this worksheet, this is not the definitive worksheet on how to answer the question, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart or what is going on here, but it's just something that you can look through um, to begin to answer that question. So um, I'm going to go through a few things real quick. To harden, a definition of to harden if you look, there's a couple different words that are used throughout Exodus, and it can mean to stiffen or make rigid, so to stiffen your heart. Or it has this idea of strengthening, which means it's going to strengthen what is already there. Okay? Strengthen what is already there to harden. Um, or it could mean, you know, to deaden. But oftentimes it is that idea of strengthening what is already there. Exodus 3.19, um, if you go back and read that, God knows that Pharaoh's heart is hard already. He is like every one of us, born with a heart in rebellion against the Lord. Okay, and Pharaoh knows in his mind he's God. He's not bowing to anybody. He has a hard heart to begin with. Okay, so then in Exodus 4.21, God will pardon Pharaoh's heart God is going to strengthen Pharaoh's heart in the position that it already is. Okay, so you can go back and read through that. Then when we get to Exodus 7, I gave Exodus 7, 13 through 14. Pharaoh's heart became hard. Okay, that's in the NIV. Um, if you're reading this in any of your versions, you should have some form of became, was, some form of that verb is which is a verb of being, okay? And so it is describing the state. Sometimes we say, if you remember back to high school English, which was a long time for me and probably some of you, um, that is a stative verb. It is just describing a state of being. It's not giving cause, just the state of being. So for example, this morning I could say, truly, I'm tired. <laughs> Now, you don't know why. I'm not saying why. Maybe I stayed up late too last night and watched a TV show, or, you know, maybe I didn't eat my breakfast, but I'm just, that's my state of being. I'm tired. So when it says Pharaoh's heart became hard or was hard, it's just describing the state of his heart as it already is and not giving us the cause, okay? It's just the state of his heart. Then the following, the numbers 1 through 10 are each plague, the 10 plagues, and what it talks about Pharaoh's heart in each plague. Is it talking about just describing the state of Pharaoh's heart, or describing Pharaoh hardening his own heart, or describing God hardening his heart? And you could read through your, those on your own, and um, just spoiler alert as you go through those, um, those first five plagues are describing just how Pharaoh's heart is. His heart was hard or that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh strengthens the hardening of his own heart. And then as we get towards the end of the plague, God hardens, God hardens, God hardens. So God is strengthening what Pharaoh earlier strengthened of his own condition in the beginning. All right, and then, uh, so it seems to move from Pharaoh's work to God's work, and what does that, what can we conclude from that? So I'm going to let you go on and um, kind of look through that on your own and think, what does this mean? Okay, so this is our quick attempt <laughs> at describing what does it mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? And does that mean that God is going to harden my heart and I'm not going to be his child. Well, no, that is not what that means. Okay. All right. He, yeah. So anyways, uh, read Romans 1. I think that's on there. It kind of describes the same uh, position of humanity and where they're at and opportunities to repent and what happens if you do not repent and what happens to the state of your heart then. It's also repeated in Romans 1 using slightly different words, but it's the exact same idea. 
All right. And the warning is, if you, uh, Hebrews 3, 7 is, what's the warning? Hebrews says, if you hear God's voice today, don't harden your heart. That's the warning to us. Stay soft towards the Lord. Don't harden your heart. Okay. Don't be like Pharaoh when God comes to you and then, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. Because you might get to the point of no return. Well, no, you know, you might get to the point of no return. And that's a scary thought. So it is scary, okay, but no one in this, no one in this room is there, <laughs> okay. Um, and there is a warning, but God is, remember, he's being gracious and merciful, giving them a chance to turn, and they harden. And then God hardens. All right, not as much time on there as I wanted to spend, but we do have some other things to move forward. All right. Let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 13 and get out um, the study guide that we worked on this last week. In last week's class time, we talked about the Passover, right? The um, shedding of the blood of that adult male without blemish lamb and how the blood would cover and so that when God came through in judgment, if you were under the blood, you were safe. Your firstborn was safe. And then um, they talked a little bit about how to um, celebrate that, to make it a yearly celebration. It was the beginning of their calendar year. It was supposed to start with this. So you just start off the year redeemed under the blood, right? That's a good way to start off your year, remembering that. Okay, looking to the past, what God did also teaching the children in the future. Okay, and then right on the heels of that Passover celebration on, day, on that day came the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we read about last week, but we read about this week in our homework as well. So we're going to read that out loud, and I'm just going to start with this table right here. Someone read Exodus 13, 3 through 10. Exodus 13, 3 through 10, to refresh our memories on this feast of unleavened bread. Okay. What are some of the particulars about this feast of unleavened bread? No yeast. Huh? Sure. What's up with that? Okay. Yes. So it takes so on that actual on the actual Passover, right? They were supposed to eat unleavened bread because it took time to raise and you weren't going to have time because when your freedom comes it's going to come quickly and you need to be ready. Okay? And so that's why they put those like bowls of unleavened bread on their head. Um, need to be ready. So that's part of it. Okay? So, the, so to remit, look back and remember, when God came, he came quickly, right? And we were, had to be ready. So it does have this idea of being ready. Good. Other particulars? Oh, yes, they needed to let their children know. Interesting. Yeah. Seven days, right? It lasted for seven days. So for seven days, you were to eat unleavened bread. You weren't to have any leaven in your house or anywhere. Um, in chapter 12 that we read last week, it also said don't do any work except for food prep, right? And the last day, what happens on the last day? Yeah, a big, like a feast. What other words do we have? Celebration. So at the end, it's a big congregational, like eating how you eat is in your home, but then you all come together as a big congregational event on that last day to celebrate. Okay, so those are some of the particulars. Um, let's see, I asked you, what are some reasons given for this? And one reason is that Sarah said, is to tell the kids, right? One reason is to pass down to the next generation, don't forget, God is a redeeming God. Don't forget, you're here because of God's gracious salvation 
of our people back in Egypt. Don't forget. So it's one reason is to pass on knowledge of God to the next generation. What's another reason? Yeah, it's an act of worship, right? To remember what he has done, to look, well, I'm answering my own question, but to look forward by passing it on to the kids. It's some sort of uh, worship service the whole, a whole week. It's supposed to be focused on the Lord. And then verse 3, to commemorate. What does it mean to commemorate? Pardon? Okay, yeah. To remember, right, to remember. So this is to remember. Remember where you came from and pass it on to the kids so that they know too, okay? So it's a remembrance. The Passover that they are to um, practice every year is the same thing. Remember and pass on. Remember who God is and pass it on. Feast of Unleavened Bread, same thing. Remember that God brought us out and remember, pass it on to the kids. All right. Oh, I did ask you. So is this seem a celebration to earn their redemption or to celebrate their redemption? Celebrate. Okay. It's a celebration and it's not an earning. And that might seem like a, well, duh, kind of question. Okay. But we're going to come back to that. Okay. Okay. It's to celebrate. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next um, feast or celebration that is talked about here. So um, here at this second table here, uh, Janelle, Lydia, can somebody read verses, chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, and then somebody else read chapter 13, verses 11 through 16. Okay? So for some reason... <laughs> In, in these chapters in Exodus, like he starts with something and then goes back and then comes back to it. Okay, so that's, that's what's happening here. Okay. All right. Passover, God says, this is the Passover. Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This little ceremony doesn't really have a name. So I said, well, what would you name it? What would you name it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Consecration of the firstborn. Actually, it says that right there in my Bible, right? <laughs> consecration of the firstborn. All right, that sounds very lovely. What does it mean to consecrate? Dedicate. Mm-hmm. Got other synonyms. Set aside. Dedicate. Good words prepare it for God maybe like it's for God devote to set aside dedicate okay so you're going to take the firstborn of things in your <laughs> in your uh, life right and they are dedicated to the Lord they are given to the Lord they are devoted to the Lord now, oftentimes in the Old Testament, when you read that something is to be devoted to the Lord, that means it is a sacrifice. Okay, so your cow, what would a cow have worked? Let's say, your, let's say your lamb has a firstborn lamb. That firstborn belongs to the Lord. So that would be a sacrifice to the Lord. Okay, or any of your animals. But then, what if it's one of your sons? your firstborn son that belongs to the Lord. What does God say for that firstborn son here? The son belongs to the Lord. How does it get devoted or consecrated to the Lord? Yes, you can buy that firstborn son back or you redeem that firstborn son. There is a substitute for that firstborn son. God provides a substitute. Just like he provided a substitute in the Passover lamb. Just like he provided a substitute when 
Abraham had Isaac up on the mountain, right? That firstborn son belongs to the Lord, but you provide a substitute. You don't sacrifice that son on the altar, okay? All right. Um, what's kind of the purpose, I think? Purpose of this event? Yeah. 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 Again, it's to remember and to remember your slavery in Egypt and to remember how you were bought and how your firstborn son was saved only by being under blood. And your firstborn son again is saved only by being under the blood of that consecrated lamb. Okay? To look back and remember. Oh, poor Pastor Eric. We'll put him up later. All right. Um, so it looks backwards in remembering. But again, it looks forward in the teaching. Right? When you are in the land, when I take you to where you're going, and when you have children, right? This is what you, I'm going to have children, and this is what you do. You're going to have flocks, and this is what you do. You remember that everything comes from me, and everything belongs to me, and you devote it to me. Now, um, I don't, Philip Riken, Philip Riken is a, a pastor. Um, he's been involved in Wheaton College, up in Wheaton College, and um, he has a, I was reading some things that he wrote, and I thought this was interesting. So this is from him, so thing to think about. He said, the firstborn son, which is true, that firstborn son carries on the name of the family, carries on the lineage of the family. And in that firstborn son is the future of the family. All right. And that firstborn son would represent all members of the family in a way that like for a, like a sports team has a captain, right? And that captain represents the whole team. So say you play football, your two captains come out, you flip a coin to see who goes first, kicks off first, and um, the captain chooses heads or tails. Now if the captain chooses heads, that means the whole team chooses heads. They're all included in what the captain decides. Okay? It's kind of like the idea of the firstborn son. The whole family is included in that firstborn son. So if that firstborn son is dedicated to the Lord... In him, the whole family is dedicated to the Lord. So God is really saying, it's not just the firstborn that belongs to me. The whole family is mine, right? Remember, you were in slavery. And remember that I brought you out. And remember that you belong to me. You don't belong to Pharaoh anymore. All of you belong to me. Okay? So that's kind of what's going on here in this consecration of the firstborn. Any questions? All right. So the Lord gives his people three different festivals, three different things to do throughout the year to look back and remember that they were slaves and that God saved them. And each of them also has this forward-looking movement. When I bring you into the land, when you are there, when you have children, tell them that God is the redeeming God. All right, so a past and a future. So that beginning of the year, Passover, followed by Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then all through the year, as things are being born and people are being born, right, you'd have that consecration of the firstborn. So throughout the year, this constant reminder, remember where you came from, that you belonged to Pharaoh. Remember that now you belong to me, and I have brought you out of that. Okay. So then I asked you something along the lines on question number three. These were observances that these people were to obey. Do we today have observances that we follow to do the same things, to look back and remember and to look forward. Communion, yes. And we have another one. Baptism. 
Okay, communion and baptism. Now, we're not going to talk about baptism today because communion follows directly from, from this, right? Okay. All right. Communion. Um, when Jesus was eating that last supper with his disciples, right, that was the Passover meal that he's eating with them. And they are looking back to remember the blood of the Passover lamb. And while they're eating a meal to remember the blood of the Passover lamb, we read in Luke 22 that Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Right? And then he says, um, this is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you. Now, we're looking back and remembering the blood of that Passover lamb. But I'm telling you now that that Passover lamb points to me, the real Passover lamb, and my blood poured out for you. It's a better blood. <laughs> it's a once-for-all blood. It's covering sin for all people, right? It's a better blood. And do this, then in 1 Corinthians, when uh, Paul talks about it, says that Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So communion is like that Passover in that we're looking back and remembering that we were enslaved, right? Not to Pharaoh, but we're enslaved to our sin, to Satan's control over our lives. We were enslaved. And we remember that. Where did we come from? But by the blood of Jesus, the lamb, right, we have been set free. And as we do this on a continual basis, and our kids see what are you doing and why, we tell them. We're freed people. God's grace has come to us in the person of Jesus, and his blood was shed for us. Right? So communion for us functions like Passover functioned for them. All right? I would say even that communion is kind of the fulfillment of that Passover meal. Right? Because... Um, well, they looked to the blood of a lamb, that real lamb is Jesus, right? And so this is the meal that we can all participate in, right? And like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they had a community thing where they would all come together and worship. Communion is a community thing, right? It's what we do as we come together to remember that together we are the saved people of God. So just like Passover, right, was not to earn their redemption, but to celebrate their redemption, communion is to celebrate our redemption. You do not get saved by how many times you take communion, right, or taking it at the right times or right before you die. Okay, that's not what saves you. Communion is a remembrance of what has already been done. For you by that lamb. Any questions? Because there could be some questions. <laughs> okay. All right. If we have time at the end, we're going to come back to this. But this could be a. All right. Um. Oh, I forgot this. So, God gives his people, Old Testament people, New Testament people, things to build into our lives to remember where we came from and where he's taken us. Why do you think he does that? Because <laughs> we forget, right? And you think, how in the world can you forget, right, that God killed the firstborn of all of Egypt and took you out? And they forget all the time. Right? But we think, how in the world could I forget that Jesus died for my sin? And yet I go on and live my life as if that never even happened, right? We just forget. And God knows that we forget. He knows that we're but dust. So he says, I'm going to give this to you as a gift. I'm going to build this into your life. Because I know you're prone to forget, and I don't want you to forget. Right? So it's his grace to us. It's not like, oh my gosh, it's this week we've got to do communion again. No, we get to come and remember all that God has done for us. And we get to look forward to his return. It's a looking back and a forward too, right? It is a great thing to do together, right? 
and we should be thankful. It's not a burden that he's put on us to practice. It's a gift because he knows that we are prone to forget. All right. Done? Good. All right, move along. Day two is the Red Sea crossing. All right, the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, we are not going to read that section of Scripture, but I want to know, as you read through that or answered some of the questions, what is something about this Red Sea crossing that stood out to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, he orchestrated every part of this. Yeah, yeah. They had to be in a certain place. Pharaoh had to be, you know, like, like he just orchestrated everything. And why do you think he orchestrated it all? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Right, right. He orchestrated it all in the way that would give him the most glory. He did not orchestrate it in the way that would, his people would not experience fear, right? But he orchestrated it in the way that he would get the most glory and that his people would learn who they are to fear. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. All right, good. Anything else? Mm. Right, right. Yeah, 600,000 men, plus women, children, animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a massive amount of logistics involved. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would have been a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the number 600 is supposed to, we're supposed to be like, wow, that is an awful lot. Like, how are you going to stand up against that? Yes, Linda. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. Well, he's bringing down judgment, right? Right? And like we talked about last week, we like to think of him revealing himself for his glory is in his salvation. But also, he does come in judgment, and he reveals his glory in judgment, too, as a precursor to be, be prepared when he comes in that final judgment. Yeah, he does destroy his enemies. <laughs> yes. 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 Now you're saying, he says, you will not see the Egyptians anymore. Right? Your enemy will be destroyed. Not just, yeah, will be gone. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 All the more glory to God. Yes. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Like they're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, to go forward and trust him. He will keep his promise, right? I mean, this promise goes back to Abraham, right? I, you're going to be there for 400 years, but I'm going to bring you back, you know? Um, yeah. But he will keep his promise, and he'll keep his promise to them, encourages us that he keeps his promise to us, right? Even if we see our enemy, like, running towards us, whatever that, you know. Yeah. Yes, Sue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he definitely came out this time, right? Right. Yeah, let's see. I liked the part where they are afraid. Well, I didn't like that they're afraid, but. Um. <laughs> and let's see. And Moses said, this is what um, Brooke was saying. Uh, my version says, don't be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord, right? He is going to fight for you, and you will never see them again, right? Don't be afraid. God fights for his people, right? So at the beginning, they're afraid of the Egyptians, and then Moses says, don't be afraid. And then at the very last verse, how does that word come up again? <laughs> what are they afraid of? The very last verse of this chapter yeah, they go from fear of their captors, Pharaoh, evil, right, to a fear and a trust, or a, it says fear and trust in the Lord and his servant. Oh, Pharaoh is scary, but what just happened here, <laughs> right? Like the Lord is real, right, and he has really saved us. And is a little awe-inspiring, right? He's bringing glory to himself through salvation and through judgment. Yeah. Okay. I think I asked you at the end, write a summary of this chapter. Or what do you think the main point of this chapter is? What kinds of things did we come up with? I know this is everybody's least favorite question. Write a summary. <laughs> well, and we know Janelle's got bullet points, right? Yeah. Short and sweet is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not too short. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the Lord fights for us. The Lord fights for us. He is our protector. He is our defender. Right? He fights for us. Great. One brave soul has gone. Does anybody else want to share there? Yes. He always keeps his promises, and he's there for us. Yes. I said uh, several things, but one of mine was, because I, you know, have like several answers, but I said God rescues his people, just like Genesis 3.15, God rescues his people and crushes the enemy, just like he said. He rescues his people, and he crushes his enemy in order to build belief and trust in his people. Right? Crushes the enemy and saves his people resulting in belief and trust. All right. All right. We are cruising along. We went really fast through the beginning part. I didn't think we are going to have to. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, well, let's just go ahead and do this. Let's look at Exodus chapter 15. Right? It says, after, remember when they came out of Egypt that first time after that Passover, and we looked at those verses, they weren't like joyful, right? It was just kind of like factual, coming out, and, you know, didn't seem like excited and exuberant, even though all of Exodus has been building up to this point. And perhaps it was because it was a little bit of a, it was quite a sobering event, right? That, that Passover was very sobering. But here we have some joy, right? Here he has some excitement, some joy. We got um, Moses' sister playing her tambourine, and people are singing, and, and so here's the joy. <laughs> so Kara's going to come up and play her tambourine for us. <laughs> yeah. Right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, okay. 
Um, I just want us to read it out loud because it's such a great um, song. So we're going to, let me see here. Okay, so this table here, somebody here at this table read verses 1 through 5. Okay, then over here, someone at this table read 6 through 8. I will read 9 through 10. Somebody here read 11 through 14. And then in this table, read 15 through 17. All right. This is this sometimes called the song by the sea, right, as they've gone through the sea, the song by the sea. All right. All right. Can you imagine singing this, right, um, after this happens? Um, as you read through this, what verses did you like? What verses stuck out to you? We probably have a variety of answers. Mm -hmm. Why did that stand out to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's comforting. Anybody else? Who is like the Lord? If we remember way back in chapter 5, when Moses first goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him, right? And Moses, when he, when he met the Lord in the burning bush, he's like, well, what's your name? <laughs> it's like he didn't know much about the Lord either. But here we see that they know a lot about God now, because they have seen his saving hand. And who is like the Lord? Yeah. Yes, Linda. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's just, right? And this was, these were the people that were trying to kill the people of God. This was the people that were trying to get rid of the Israelites through who the Savior of the world is coming. Remember, it's just this cosmic kind of battle going on. And God crushes his enemy. No, my Savior, with the blast of his mouth. Yeah, that is some... <laughs> That is some strong Marys there, yeah. Yeah, yes. Interest, yes, yeah. Um, you know, in, in Revelation, when he comes back, it's like with the breath from his mouth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he will, he will conquer, yeah. Good. Um, I drew this map up here, lovely map again. For this, oh, this is why. Because um, they start up here, if you, if you follow their travels, they start up here in this Ramses, kind, you know, Goshen. They come down to the Succoth area. Now, where exactly did they cross the Red Sea? That is the archaeologists talk about that. All right. So I'm just going to give you some options. Okay. Maybe you have other, something else that you have heard. But one option is like, you know, this, this little bit of something water up here perhaps this extended all the way up here and they crossed somewhere up here perhaps they came down here and crossed you know maybe they traveled down here and this is where they crossed there is a, a thought based on some archaeology that they actually came all the way over here and crossed over this way okay so if you have a study bible it will probably give some of those options if they crossed over here, that puts Mount Sinai over here, okay, and um, Kadesh Barnea and some different places. 
I am going to go with crossing somewhere around in here or maybe down here, but that Mount Sinai is down here. That's just a traditional, historical um, thought. There are some reasons why um, they think it could have been over here, which, which it may be. Like, we honestly don't know. Like, there's no, you can't go over and say, oh, this mountain has Mount Sinai stamped on the bottom of it, so we know exactly where it was, okay? Um, so anyways, I just want you to know, like, if we're going to talk about it com be coming down here to Mount Sinai, but if you see a map that has them coming across here this way, over to here, it's not because... Um, the Bible's not trustworthy. It's not because, you know, it's, it, it's just because we just don't actually know. Um, there's re archaeological reasons why people say it's here. There's archaeological reasons why people say it's here. We're, we're just going to go with here. Okay? All right. Yes, did somebody? Oh, okay. All right. Um, but anyways, crossing the Red Sea. So as they crossed the Red Sea, they sang this song, this beautiful song. Um, I also liked, you know, like many people here, 11, 12, and 13, who among you is like the gods? And 13, in your unfailing love, you will lead those you have redeemed, okay? You have redeemed us from our enemy. You have brought us out of slavery, and you will continue to lead us, right? In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. You will guide them all the way to yourself. All the way home to the holy dwelling with the Lord. Okay, so these people who just saw the Lord save them, who have been given um, some ordinances to follow, to remember that God saved them, and to look forward to the future that he's going to give them and bring them into and pass on to the children. These people that have just sang, the Lord will take us all the way. Right? They continue on that traveling. Okay, We're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back and look at these people with these promises and the song that they just sang. Do they remember as they travel. All right, let's take a break. All right, one of, those, one of those pieces of paper that you got said traveling to Mount Sinai. So let's get that piece of paper out, traveling to Mount Sinai. This was too much to put in day five of your homework, so we're going to do it in class together. Traveling to Mount Sinai. Remember, those people that have been given those, um, the promise, you are going to go forward. I am going to take you to the land. You are going to have children and animals being born. I will lead the people that I have redeemed. And remember, he's got, the, we didn't talk about it, but right, that pillar of smoke and fire that goes before them. So they have all of the, like a visual and songs and ceremonies to remind them we're going to get there. We're going to get there, okay? And so they start on their travels. Egypt is gone in the past, and they're going to be coming, I think, but I could be wrong, but I think down this way here. And this is where um, they're going to be as we talk about them today, all right? Now, I have section A, B, and C. I'm going to give you a section. I'm going to assign you a section, okay? And then at your table, you're going to read those verses, and you're going to answer those questions, and then you're going to report back to us, okay? All right, so let's give this table here. Jan is running. Oh, <laughs> I thought she was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. So we will give you A. This table here has um, section A. We'll give uh, this table here section B. Okay, now, section B, you have a lot of verses. You have more reading than anybody does. But I, you don't have to read it for super detail. Okay, it, it might be fairly familiar to you, but you do need a lot of reading. 
Okay, and then section C, we're going to give to two different tables, this table and this table. All right? Now, in your, as you go through, as you go through, you're going to come upon a New Testament verse. Someone at your table needs to keep that open in your Bible so that you can read that New Testament verse to us when we get to it. All right? All right. Now, doing it this way, not everybody gets to read every passage, okay? But you can go back and read it on your own if you want to. But um, we're going to start off with section A, okay? Table A, what can you tell us about what, what's going on here? What's going on? Okay, three days without water. Okay. So, so, three days without water. Oh, well, they were grumbling, and what were they grumbling about? <laughs> they are thirsty, right? Does that seem reasonable? Three days without water, right? You'd be thirsty. You'd want some. And they came to this place called Mara, which is an oasis. And when they come up to this oasis, you'd think they would be excited, right? And they get there, and why don't they drink the water? It's called bitter water, right? It's like, I don't know, sulfur water, I don't know, undrinkable water, bitter water. And they're grumbling. Now, every table was asked, um, is grumbling a big deal or not? What do you guys think? Is grumbling a big deal or not? Mm-hmm. Ooh, Yeah. Human nature, I like that. It seems to be human nature. And remember, our human nature is sinful. <laughs> but, it's human nature, but it shows a lack of faith and trust. I like that. Grumbling. I was looking up grumbling a little bit. Because all throughout these first five books of the Old Testament, right, we're gonna, which we, you just hear a lot about grumbling. And it's always talk, you know, like it's a sin to grumble. To grumble is like what you said. It's 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 um, verbalizing faithlessness. It shows lack of faith and trust. It's expressing discontent, but in a way that shows faithlessness. Okay, we don't believe. They have already forgotten. God said, told them, "I'm going to take you to that land," and they've already forgotten. They sang a song, the Lord who saved us is going to take us all the way home, and they forgot. Okay, so grumbling is not going to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is difficult, and I don't know what to do. Can you help me in my need, please? Like, I don't understand. No, that's expressing your discontent in a faithful way to the Lord. And our psalms are filled with examples of that, okay? But God doesn't care for us. He's not, tr he's not taking care of us. We're going to die in the desert. Yeah, yeah. That was so awesome back there, right? We should have just gone back there. We had water to drink, right? No, that is faithlessness, right? They do not believe that God is going to take them all the way home, that he's going to keep his promise. And so they're expressing their discontent but in a faithless way okay so we're going to think about grumbling like that okay it's faithless expression of discontent what could they have done in, instead of grumble okay mm-hmm Fear, distressed, desperation, all of those things brought them to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Then Moses cries out to the Lord. The people don't cry out to the Lord, but Moses does cry out to the Lord. Um, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, Sarah. What, is, what are some of the things that you guys answered? Any other things? What could they have done in, besides grumble? Same answers, different answers. Remember, right? They could have remembered. <gasps> no, what did God say? What's his word? 
They should have sung. <laughs> they should have, they only, <laughs> they should have sung. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They could have encouraged one another. Well, you know, like someone starts grumbling. Oh, you know, we should have gone back to Egypt. What if some beside, someone beside them said, now remember, remember. They could have encouraged one another to look back to God's word and trust in his character, right? Okay, all kinds of things instead of grumbling. But as Sarah said, Moses went before the Lord and asked what to do. And then what did God tell him to do? Yeah, yeah. Who knows what happened, right, right? It seems kind of ridiculous, but he told him to... Okay, right, right. Do an action before the people. Take this piece of wood and throw it in the water, and then the water became good to drink. All right. Now, as you read through this, it seems pretty self-explanatory, but then it goes on, which seems a little disconnected to me a little bit, because then he says... Um, the Lord made a decree there. Oh, well, let's do this. First of all, he tested them. Okay. Uh, what was the test and did they pass? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ah. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, that's good. It is a little confusing as you read through here because it's got the waters are bitter and then the waters are made good. And then he goes on and says, um, there he tested them, for he made a decree and there he tested them. Now, in my thinking, Ashley's a little different, but I'm, you know, I hadn't thought about it the way you're thinking about it. I thought the test was more like, you're thirsty and you need water. And what are you going to do? And if that was the test, then they failed. Okay. But then, but he does go on and he says, um, if you listen carefully, as Ashley said, if you listen carefully and do what is right and all of these things, I will not bring on you any of the diseases of Egypt. And you're just like, what? They're just talking about water. <laughs> and they're talking about diseases. And so I, I don't know if this is the connection or not, but um, so... I wonder if God is saying, your water was bad, and I could heal your water. You know, trust me in all areas. I will, I will keep you safe. I can heal your diseases. Okay, because he's telling them, I am the healer. So maybe it's a progression. I'm not sure. It just seems a little disjointed. I'm not comfortable with disjointed. I like everything to flow together. So maybe I'm just trying to force it to flow together there, but... Um, you know, I, I can take care of you, right? I can give you water. I can heal your bodies. It's something physical. Then I had you guys go to, <coughs> excuse me, Luke chapter 5. <coughs> can you read Luke chapter 5? Okay. 31 through 32. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here on, in the wilderness, God is saying, I, I'm your healer, right? And then in the New Testament, God the Son comes and says, I didn't come for those who are well. I'm a healer. I'm coming for the sick, and I'm coming for the sick to call them to repentance. Not a, not a bodily healing, although he does do bodily healing, right? But an inner healing, a forgiveness from sin, right? So we see God as the healer here, and we see Jesus when he comes, and he says, I am going to provide the, the better healing. I mean, not, our bodies are important. I'm not putting bodies down, right? But an, a healing from sin, a healing from sin. All right. So they kind of have their first test. What do we do? We come upon difficulties. They fail. We're going to die. Of course, God's not going to take care of us. We want to go back to Egypt. They continue on. Table B, I think is this table. Okay, what goes on in, what 
goes on and what's your bullet points of your summary, Janelle? <laughs> yeah. Okay, they're hungry. Yes, okay. So they're hungry because there's no food. So they grumble. For two days. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So again, perfect. Traveling, hungry, grumbling. God's not taking care of us. Can he, is he going to provide us? Is he going to get us there? Um, God provides them manna, right? And that manna is called bread from heaven. Um, if you have your Bibles open to Exodus 16, chapter, or verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Bread from heaven for you. I will provide what you need. Bread from heaven will come down. Your bodies need food. I'm going to give your bodies food. And this is a miraculous food that he fed them the whole time they were in the desert. Okay, it's miraculous food that he fed them the whole time. Okay, I had you guys read some verses in John. Do you have those verses open? Okay, so at the beginning of this I said, when you read your verses in the New Testament, someone at your table <laughs> needs to leave your Bible open. So for the tables that are coming up, yes, perfect. I'm sorry, I, I was just giving you time to turn. Okay, all right, John chapter 6. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, let's stop there for a minute. So what does Jesus say he is? This table? True bread from heaven, right? And if you read this whole chapter, it's very easy to see he is absolutely talking about this event in Exodus. As God provided you physical food in the wilderness to sustain you on your way home, I am the true bread from heaven coming to physically sustain you as I take you home. I am the true bread from heaven. Okay, read um, verses 48 through 51 then, please. I am the living bread, right? They needed that bread, but they eventually died in the desert, right? If you eat me, Jesus says metaphorically, okay, right? I am the bread that will give you eternal life. I am the true bread from heaven, right? So these things that we see in the wilderness are pictures, right, that Jesus comes and fulfills. He is the true bread. All right. Any other comments or thoughts or all right, let's move on to section C. Uh, we'll start with this table here. What's going on here in section C? <laughs> They're grumbling again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They're thirsty again. Mm hmm Okay, they're mad at God. They're mad at Moses. Yep. Same old thing, same old thing. They do it here, they do it here, they do it here, right? We've got patterns of unbelief. Okay, right. Then, okay, good. So this table here, 
What does God tell Moses to do? Strike a rock. He tells him to take your staff and go strike a rock. Okay, then when he strikes the rock, what happens? Out comes the water. If you're not familiar with the story, he's going to hit that rock and out comes the water. All right, so we did not talk about this in the plagues, but so we have to catch up a little bit. But that's a staff is a symbol of authority, of, of judicial authority. I am going to bring a, a judgment, a right judgment, a wrong judgment. So when um, Aaron goes out with that staff and, you know, waves it over the water, he's passing judgment on Egypt because he has that with his staff of judicial authority. <laughs> okay, so God tells Moses, you take your staff and you go out to a rock. Now, I'm thinking if you're an Israelite, You'd be like, ooh, we have been grumbling quite a bit. And when Moses took his staff, out came God's judgment on sin. And now he's taking his staff, and out is going to come judgment. Okay, but what does he hit? The rock. Well, what'd the rock do? What'd the rock do? Okay, so back to this table, I had you... Look at everybody. Everybody turn to 1 Corinthians. But I'll have you guys read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Yes, can one of you read it? Yes, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. That's okay. They all, so he's talking about those, these people wandering around in the wilderness, or not, not wandering, they're en route to Mount Sinai, but going through the wilderness, and um, they're eating the same food, that manna from heaven, sent, a spiritual food sent from heaven. They're drinking the same water that came from the rock, and that rock is Christ. That rock is Christ. So, what is this, how, does this, how is this rock a picture of Jesus? Okay. So the rock was struck, like Jesus was struck on the cross. Yeah. Who deserves to get struck? The people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So God could have brought judgment on the people, right? But he brings it on the rock. And in the New Testament, we learn that rock is a picture of Jesus. Jesus takes the judgment that we deserve, right? We see that often in the lamb that we talked about, that Passover lamb. But this is another picture, and we don't often think of this picture. But it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He struck the rock, and that striking of the rock brings a consequence, and out flows the living water. Okay. I would say that's probably more a picture of the Spirit. So Jesus was struck and ascended, and out pours the Spirit into our lives. Right? That empowerment to be different, that living water, that life Jesus gives to us through the Spirit. Right? So it's a beautiful picture, I think, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. 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 Outflowed the water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So each table I asked, what do you learn about God, Moses, or the people? Each table, I want you to tell me one thing. It can be about God or Moses or the people. What did you guys learn? Hmm. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Good. Times of stress will test our faith, right? And what do we do when our faith is being tested? Okay, talking to myself right now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Whew. Give me a moment. Okay. What do we do when our faith is being tested? Where do we turn? Where do we turn? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what? When you grumble, you're wrong. But the rock was stricken for you. And the Spirit gives us the, applies that forgiveness and empowers us to turn to God in faith instead of grumble away from him. Yes, okay. This table, what is something you learned about God or Moses or the people? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of growing to do. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. As we <laughs> sympathize with them in that. Yes, a lot of growing to do. Okay, this table. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Yes, we have real physical bodily needs, and God wants to meet our real physical bodily needs, right? And he also meets our deeper <laughs> spiritual um, need for forgiveness and power and life. Okay. All right, this table. Mm hmm Oh, so good. Jesus is, oh, you're leading me right where I want to go. <laughs> God is orchestrating it all together. No. Jesus is our rock, and he did not grumble. That Israel that God says, my firstborn son is in the wilderness and being tested, and they fail. But God sent his only begotten son, the son of God, to come to the earth. And he was tested in the wilderness three times. And he did not fail. Right? That made him worthy to be that spotless Passover lamb. That made him worthy to be the rock able to be stricken and take the judgment for us. Jesus is that stricken, non-grumbling <laughs> rock. Right? He can heal us because he was stricken, right? He is our very life because he was stricken. He sends his spirit to fill us because he was stricken. And that spirit helps us turn from faithlessness, right, to trust and remembering. From grumbling to prayers of just admitting our great desperation and need for the Lord to intervene. From thinking God is out to get me, wrong thinking, right, to thinking God will lead me safely home. All these things we have because Jesus is the bread of life, our healer, and the stricken rock, right? Lessons to learn along the way to Mount Sinai. to learn. I would like us to close first of all before we go to that can somebody just pray thanking the Lord <laughs> for all of us for who he is and how we've seen him in along the way <laughs> it, okay Linda thank you all right. At your tables, I think the last question of your homework perhaps was what are you learning through Exodus? What is God impressing on you as we go through Exodus? I would like you to share that at your tables and then share um, prayer requests. Pray for Pastor Eric. Don't forget, we're going to tell him we're going to pray for him. So pray for Pastor Eric at your tables and his family and churches being planted um, in southern Africa. And, yeah, then we done.